there's no button. We're on. There we go. <laughs> I invite you to find a button. Hello, guys. Um, everyone, welcome to our uh, uh, semifinals two in the peripheral challenging case competition. Um, we've got an exciting, fun panel here that will be hearing about these cases. Myself, I'm Peter Montaleone. I'm an interventional cardiologist in Austin, Texas. I'm going down the roster, uh, joined by Dr. Sherling Tsai from UT Southwestern, uh, Dr. Matt Bunty from uh, St. Luke's Mid-America Heart Institute, and Dr. Zach Rosal from Baylor. Um, so thank you guys for being here. Uh, the way this will be set up is it will be five minutes of a presentation. You'll see your little timer here as you're speaking, followed by five minutes of panel discussion and, and questions from the group for each case. Uh, we'll be talking at the end about cases to potentially go on to the next round uh, to be done on Saturday, which you'll hear from the, from the CVI uh, group after uh, this session. So we'll invite up our first speaker, uh, Dr. Joy Sang who will be talking on a breathtaking complication after ablation using multimodal imaging for timely diagnosis of acquired pulmonary vein stenosis. Thank you so much for being here. So hi, I'm Joy Yi. I'm a third year medical student at UC Davis, and I'm here to present a case on the importance of diagnosis of acquired PVS pulmonary vein stenosis. So just a quick background uh, on PBS. Prevalence does range in papers, and it is mostly seen to be less than 5%, though there is a high morbidity and mortality when detected later, which is why it's important to keep this on your differential and roll it out, especially with patients with previous radiofrequency ablations for atrial fibrillation. So our case presentation is a 62-year-old female. She was a previous smoker, and she had a partial radiofrequency ablation in 2014 and a repeat in 2015. Since then, she has remained in sinus rhythm, but she eventually presented with a gradual onset of fatigue, chest pain, cough, and hemoptysis several months after, but no complaints of night sweats or weight loss. She was then worked up by an outside hospital in 2019, and it seems it took a while to work up just because she didn't get medical attention until it really started affecting her daily living. And so at the outside hospital, she was able to get chest x-rays and CTs, which resulted in their suspicion of either reoccurring pneumonia or a pulmonary embolism embolism, which she was subsequently treated for, and she was placed on anticoagulation. But her symptoms continued to not get better. So they thought there was a possibility of maybe interstitial lung disease because it looked like she may have fibrosis on the imaging, and they did a transbronchial biopsy, which yielded no findings. At this point of time, she was, fi she was referred to our institution for evaluation of either atypical pneumonia versus ILD. At our institution, it was found upon independent review of her outside CT films that there was actually evidence of PBS, although it was never noted in any of the imaging. And this was suspected to probably be the culprit of her chronic edema and atelectasis of her left lower lobe seen on imaging. And she actually ended up being admitted to UC Davis for severe dyspnea and fatigue. And on this admission, on physical exam, she had a regular rate and rhythm. Sure, she was heard to have crackles in her left lower lung fields, but labs showed a normal D-dimer, uh, normal BNP, low trope, and normal EKG. We did want to do a VQ scan because the pulmonologist that had seen her before had suggested it, but at that time it was COVID, so we did not do that. And a repeat CT was done, which did confirm severe PBS. This slide is just showing the echo and the diagnostic pulmonary angiogram performed, showing stenosis in the left superior uh, pulmonary vein as well as the inferior pulmonary vein. So after discussion of treatment options, which ranged from conservative treatment of just watching her all the way to a potential partial lobectomy, she for sure did not want a conservative treatment just because she could barely walk half a block without being very, very out of breath. And so she did want some type of intervention. And so we kind of did a hybrid approach in which she got, um, she would go under pulmonary vein venoplasty and we would watch her and if her symptoms started back again or gotten worse then would go towards the partial lobectomy of her left lower lobe and mainly because there's probably a VQ mismatch there's ventilation but no perfusion in that area and these 3D reconstructions show the occlusion of before and then post stent patent left superior pulmonary vein. 
At one month and a year follow-up, she did describe her full return and she was doing very well overall. And CT angio of uh, her in January of this year actually still showed uh, no stent restenosis or any res residual stenosis. So this case shows us that it's very important to use multimodal imaging, whether it be echo, VQ scans, uh, CT, and it's important to think about in a patient who have had a um, radiofrequency ablation for atrial fibrillation. Just for her, it took a really long time to eventually get to the bottom of her symptoms. And treatment options can vary, and it's really based on the patient and what they're really feeling, from conservative management to percu intervention to all the way to surgery. So some just learning points. Acquired PVS is a rare complication of catheter ablations that can be difficult to diagnose and manage. I think mainly because it mimics many pulmonary pathologies. And so it's important to keep this in mind and timely diagnosis is crucial. Thank you. Wonderful job. You're, did you say you're a third year medical student? Yeah. That's spectacular. So complicated pathology and complicated treatment, so really, yeah. really well done. Thank you. Um, to the panel, has anyone had to treat pulmonary vein stenosis either in a post ablation procedure? And what, what their interventional thoughts did you give to it? Yes. <laughs> One, um, it's nerve wracking, <laughs> uncharted territory. Um, and I think one thing is noted, I hopefully we will see less of it because I think it was more common with radio frequency ablation, whereas yeah. people are moving more towards cryoablation. Mm -hmm. That's why right. looking into the matrix EP evaluation of it. Um, but when we've done these, which is rare, we are, we just take our time. It's very difficult to engage and then also to image because you're, you're imaging against flow, so you have to deep seat a catheter um, and image it. The multimodality imaging is huge. We bring our, our main CTA um, reader and our structural heart CT reader comes into the room with us when we do this and runs the TEE. Um, and then we just slowly and serially dilate up, um, and starting with smaller balloons. Um, and almost always we've placed stents just mm -hmm. because it's usually a fibrotic lesion, so you need there's going to be significant recoil. Um, but not overdoing it and knowing you can always come back to fight another day for a chronic problem like this has kind of been our approach. Yeah, and and it looks like you guys had used an OmniLink Elite, right? So yes. it was a so a balloon expandable uncovered stent. In your practice, did you guys use coverts, especially with the VBXs, just because perforation risk is obviously yeah a concern definitely there. high enough concern. We usually haven't, um, just because we've have been really intentional with sizing and then serially dilating up with a balloon, and then not I mean, we'll take whatever balloon size we maximally dilate to. That's the stent size we take, knowing that it you're not going to make it perfect, um, but what you're trying to do is relieve some of the obstruction. That's so. great. And, and remind me, did, did you guys do any follow-up imaging, or, or do you think of any follow-up imaging? Yeah, so they did do follow-up imaging, but the most recent one that I talked about was just January for her CT angio, because I know like re from the lit review that yeah, restenosis, especially with just balloon and no stent, is very, very high. And so you have to continue to follow up. And her symptoms didn't get worse, and she was feeling good. So, is there any hemodynamic follow up for this? And like, this is a pathology I don't really ever think about, but, um, <laughs> and honestly have never heard about it because, and we have so many patients who get AFib ablation, mm. right? But do these patients um, get like elevated right heart pressures or PA pressures? just from the congestion, um, and then how do you, like short of doing a CTA, how do you follow these? Maybe a dumb question. No, <laughs> not, no questions. Not cardiologist. No, not, not at all. This falls into the category of diseases cardiologists cause so they can treat them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, as was mentioned, like ventilation perfusion kind of mismatches can be findings kind of following clinical symptoms in the right kind of clinical categories. I, I, I imagine as someone you know, that's done kind of assisted in a couple of these when it was more complex, you could follow VQs, you could follow CAT scans, but you're not going to see much. Um, Our right heart casts were not very telling um, when we did it. It's not like there was significant pulmonary hypertension. You have enough other perfusion throughout the lung that offsets the, the massive hemodynamic part of it. Um, so it really is a clinical diagnosis of exclusion. And yeah, we've repeat, we've done repeat CTAs to more or less ensure that the stent isn't occluded. But even if it was occluded, if their symptoms weren't there, I, we, we haven't, I don't think we've had one that's occluded, but I would 
my reintervention would be driven completely by the, the clinical picture. I, and you know, in our last minute, it's, it's a patient population oftentimes is having ablation to try and get them off anticoagulation, but now with a stent in their pulmonary vein, are, were they kept on either antiplatelet or anticoagulation? So they were, and also before that, she was put on anticoagulation because the outside hospital thought she had PE and recurring PE, but then eventually when she was at our institution, the reasoning to actually like keep her on anticoagulation coagulation, she was switched from orphan to rivaraxaban, was because of the fact that like there was like concern of blood stasis, and so she was continued on her normal dose. Is that consistent with, with what you guys do in your cases? Yeah. 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 Um, even, if so, even if someone, say they had a left atrial appendage ligation or an occlusion device placed, this is someone that I would still treat usually with a DOAC and Plavix initially and then de-escalate into a DOAC. I'd maybe get to a prophylactic dose six, 12 months down the road rather than a full dose if they had other reasons to not be on one. Um, but it's still a low flow portion of the heart um, coming from the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. Um, and so it's not, like an aortic, it's not like we're dealing with an aortic system or something with the left ventricle. This is a low flow state. So the stasis risk is definitely of concern. Wonderful. Well, great job. Thank great. you so much for Thank presenting. Thank you so much. Um, next, we'll invite uh, Dr. McCall Walker um, to speak on, is two better than one rendezvous technique for peripheral CTO crossing? Thank you so much for being here. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, McCall Walker. Um, I just started my interventional cardiology year at UT Southwestern. The title of my presentation today is Two Better Than One, Rendezvous Technique for Peripheral CTO Crossing. I have no disclosures. We'll start with a case. This is Ms. G. She's 53. She has multiple comorbidities, as you can see on the screen, as well as PAD. She previously has undergone a balloon angioplasty and a FEMPOP bypass in her right lower extremity, and now presents to our clinic with lifestyle limiting claudication in her left lower extremity. Uh, as you can see, her exam on the bottom left is uh, relatively unremarkable. On the right side of the screen, um, you can see that her ABI in the left lower extremity is 0 0.68 with decreasing PVR um, amplitudes in her waveforms as you move distally. She underwent a CTA aorta with runoff prior to uh, being referred to us, which showed an approximate 15 centimeter uh, SFA CTO with reconstitution um, at the transition of the SFA to the popliteal. Uh, the top image here shows the reconstitution. The bottom shows that she has three vessel runoff distal to this. There is a mild to moderate amount of calcification that was remarked upon on the CTA. She was then taken to the cath lab and underwent peripheral angiogram. We obtained access through the right common femoral artery. We crossed aortic bifurcation with a long six French sheath. You can see in the image on the left that at first it's not totally apparent where the proximal CTO cap is, but upon interrogation at an extreme orthogonal angle on the right, you can see that it's right at the bifurcation of the SFA and the profunda. The next image on the right um, that just loaded shows the distal reconstitution by collaterals uh, in the adductor canal. We had a mid-SFA zone of operation for this uh, procedure. We had an initial wire catheter approach, and we did have the uh, foot draped for possible pedal access uh, for a hybrid technique such as rendezvous. Our contingency plan was a reverse cart uh, with a failed um, wire catheter technique or rendezvous. We first used telescoped 035 and 018 catheters over an 014 wire. Um, we took uh, great care to make very few dissection attempts with very small uh, dissection planes to preserve anatomy for a possible rendezvous. Um, unfortunately, our uh, reentry attempts were unsuccessful with a wire catheter technique. Given that this was consistent with a type 2C lesion, again, of length approximately 150 millimeters, we had discussed prior to the start of the case um, a possible hybrid rendezvous technique. In general, um, this is used more selectively in claudicants and in those that have uh, more than one vessel runoff to the foot, so we felt fairly comfortable with this patient. We left a space occupying catheter as a, acting as a receiving catheter um, anti-grade in the mid left SFA CTO. We then uh, under ultrasound guidance obtained access with a four or five French radial access sheath in the left posterior tib tibial artery. 
We then used an 018 catheter over an 014 SV5 wire. We advanced this into the distal CTO for targeting purposes, and we did try um, briefly a, another wire uh, catheter um, intraluminal approach here, but uh, were unsuccessful. So our wire was exchanged for an Estado, and you can see on this next side, uh, we performed our rendezvous. So first, our proximal and distal catheters were advanced until they were in close proximity. We then uh, got into the uh, retrograde subintimal space with our stato wire. We advanced this wire into the proximal receiving catheter. We externalized it from the right common femoral artery. We uh, utilized IVIS at this time, which showed uh, an approximate 10 to 15 millimeter segment of subintimal tracking. We followed this with both 4-0 and 5-0 semi-compliant balloon angioplasty. Uh, we then used a 5-0 drug-coated balloon, and as you can see, it's maybe a little tough, but the image on the left, there's a um, restricted calcified waste uh, with this drug-coated balloon up. We hit that with a 3-0 angiosculpt, and it gave. Um, the Cine uh, DSA all the way on the right shows our post-ballooning um, SFA. There is quite sluggish flow and some residual stenosis here, so we decided to stent. Uh, first with a 60 by 150 self-expanding stent and then a 60 by 100. There is roughly 1.5 um, centimeters of overlap here and we post dilated with a 5-0 uh, non-compliant coronary balloon with minimal residual stenosis. Our completion angiogram showed a widely patent uh, stented F SFA segment and it takes a little while to load here but on the right you can see that we maintained uh, three vessel runoff um, to our, uh, our distal um, leg here. In conclusion, the rendezvous technique can be summarized as follows. First, there's targeted advancement of an antegrade guide wire with limited subintimal dissection. We prevent recoil of the antegrade subintimal space by placing a space occupying catheter there. There's then retrograde entry into the subintimal space with a penetrating wire, followed by advancement of this wire into the antegrade catheter to complete the technique. Um, I'd just like to thank uh, Dr. Banerjee for his help with this case and for um, being a fantastic mentor to me, and I'm happy to take any questions. Wonderful. Th thank you, Dr. Walker. Uh, it's, a, it's a great description of a classic scenario and a really nice description of an elegant technique for crossing a, an occlusion. Um, I, I want to ask the panel a little bit about uh, two, two topics. One, you know, when we first started talking about the retrograde experience, it, it was oftentimes taught as if you can't get across antegrade, get across retrograde, right? Sometimes that retrograde do wire doesn't cross, and, and, and this is where techniques like rendezvous can really work well. Um, what do you guys do when you're coming from below if that wire does, doesn't pass smoothly? Do you rendezvous first? Do you use particular microcatheters that help you rendezvous? Do you card early? What do you guys do, Dr. Sai? Um, so I think a couple of important points. First, you really try not to re-enter or rendezvous in the common femoral. That can be a problem. That, that, that's what leads to urgent common femoral endarterectomy, I feel like. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I think what you guys did here was perfect. You want to try to meet them up in the mid-SFA. Um, and there's definitely been times where you try to just shove this thing right up into the common femoral and hope that you enter in the common femoral, but that's kind of dicey. So, um, and I, th I think Dr. Banerjee has also convinced me that we should be doing the rendezvous technique, but prior to this, we have tried all sorts of other things. Um, the, I actually have tried re-entry catheters, like re-entry devices. That was the thing I would try before. If I couldn't re-enter, you know, you try from the top, try from the bottom. If I couldn't get in, if I couldn't connect anything from the bottom, I would try again from the top with the Pioneer. Um, which has its pluses and minuses. That's sort of the way I, back, I would back up into these things. The other thing is, like, I was also taught that if I can't do something technically, like cannulate the catheter, it's not my fault. It's because the wire is wrong or the catheter is wrong. So I have a pretty low threshold to just change out the system. So I'm, I'm, I think it's pretty amazing you got into the catheter with an Estado wire, which is like completely non-steerable, right? It's like a great wire for poking and like perforating, <laughs> but I don't think you can steer it very well. I think Banerjee does put an angle on it, but, um, but oftentimes if I can't get through with one wire, I just change out to another wire. So I get a command wire or something else that is a little more steerable, and then I change out the catheter system too, from a straight to an angled or something, um, because uh, you know sometimes you just need a different system to try to get this to work. I will say that I, um, I 
with your comment on the Estado wire. Um, at, at this point, I had been in maybe two or three of these. And uh, I was frankly shocked that uh, really, honestly, within a, a few seconds of us um, crossing into the anti-grade um, uh, space, uh, the, the wire went in the catheter. So maybe that was dumb luck. I, you know, I don't know, but uh, it, uh, it, it worked out well. And, um, and, and I hear what you're saying about that. Yeah, I think as my mentor would say, it's all in the setup. So obviously, yeah. you guys set it up so well that it worked really well. So I think that's the other key here is that you have to set it up with a small space and things like mm -hmm. that. Banerjee always says that when you make a small space, there's nowhere else for the wire to go, but that's not true. I know this from experience. <laughs> there is other places for the wire to go, but you can try to optimize your setup, right? Yeah, Dr. Bunty, what do you think? So I want an algorithm for retro. I, I just wanted to emphasize Dr. Sai's uh, wise words about trying to avoid the common femoral segment when you're trying to make these connections. And I, too, agree that it's easier said than done. You know, a lot of this stuff looks easy, but it's with good preparation and uh, kind of having a plan. Um, but sometimes these wires on the rendezvous technique will just not cross that intimal plane. It's just really hard either for that anterograde or retrograde wire to, to meet in the middle and get on the same dissection plane. Uh, and so um, I too will sometimes use facilitated reentry uh, with an either an Outback or a Pioneer. But I would say most of the time um, uh, you can by using a, a steerable CTO wire with a 45 degree small hook, you can find another track. And uh, the, I think the, the really challenging cases are those with really heavy um, uh, calcification where there's just nowhere else to go. Then you run into issues of uh, wire support in order to, whether you're coming from the top or the bottom. So I think, uh, you know, preparing yourself, using um, good support, and then trying to find a zone that looks favorable for reentry. The rendezvous technique is my favorite technique, uh, but it doesn't work all the time, and so you just need to be prepared to move on to the next step. That's great. And, you know, and, and, and so in my personal practice, I do very similar things to what the panel says. You know, if you're coming up from the foot and you're coming up with a wire with a microcatheter across it, whether that's 018 or something with an 014 wire through it, that catheter itself creates a channel coming retrograde, and so it's almost like a facilitated rendezvous. If that catheter fights its way up to the two wires are interacting and you just pull that catheter back, that small space is a slightly bigger space. And oftentimes my rendezvous will be puncturing antegrade into that space where the catheter was, which also saves you four minutes not having to externalize that wire, somewhere between four and 18 minutes. So. Um, I think with that, we're, we're running, we, we've run out of our question time. So thank you so much for being here. Great classic case and really nicely described technique. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, next, we will invite up Dr. Uh, Mahesh Ar Ananta Nar Narayanan. Um, I, I, I did my best. I uh, will be speaking on diabetes dialysis deposition of calcium, a bad combination. Can we call this a bony vessel? Thank you again for the opportunity. and. Um, Today I wanted to show you a case where we deal with this uh, once in a while pretty bad um, calcification in your arteries and uh, trying to uh, get through that can be pretty challenging. And the patient has uh, diabetes and he's on dialysis um, with a lot of calcium as I can show you here. All right. 61-year-old African-American male with a history of diabetes, hypertension on dialysis presented with right lower extremity necrotic toes. He has had no prior interventions in the past with respect to his leg. He was refused by vascular surgery to extensive calcification and no site for anastomosis of bypass. And um, they attempted SFA intervention times two another intervention, um, two other institutions before he was transferred to us. That's the picture. You can see um, extensive calcification involving iliac and femoral artery, and there is a high-grade lesion in the external iliac artery. And, I'm going to show you the mid to distal SFA. It's like a rock, um, and there's reconstitution at the P1 segment of popliteal distal SFA, kind of, and then there is faint 2 vessel runoff to the leg and deceased PT as well as perineal in the mid vessel. So that's what we're starting with. And I just want to show you the steps that I tried doing before I show you the pictures of interventions. And <laughs> trying to get a sheath across was a challenge. Destination sheath, all the braiding will not be able to, to be advanced, so getting that sheath was challenging. And then there was an external iliac lesion, which we won't be able to advance wire past that. So I wired through that. Um, I used um, a confianza wire to poke through that. Um, 
and were able to get through distal lumen and dilated that with the balloon first to create a tact and was able to pass uh, through the balloon um, 035 wire into that um, profunda and was able to advance the sheath into the iliac after. Now you had to do balloon assisted tracking to track that destination to get into that um, right iliac. We tried accessing from above uh, with ocelot drilling, but um, the support was too bad, and tried angle glide of the microcatheter, tried to get through that SFA occluded segment, but could not advance um, our angle glide uh, with the microcatheter. And then we got PT access, but ocelot was getting stuck to every calcified segment and wouldn't be able to pass um, past the popliteal segment. We did the balloon, the distal SFA from above, and um, I was using a reverse car technique where I had a balloon in the subminimal space. I mean, um, Brenda was great, but when it comes to a lot of calcification, you have no prediction of where the wire is gonna go, and it's, it's such a big vessel. Um, so in this case, I've literally had to blow up a big balloon in the distal SFA, and we have to, uh, we had to go from below to just poke through that, and uh, got into with the reverse car technique, and were able to externalize the wire, um, and started performing extensive atherectomy, starting from PT all the way into the SFA. I'm sorry, that should have come above that, but um, uh, further atherectomy of SFA, and then um, last uh, perineal after atherectomy of the PT into TP trunk, uh, so re-entered from above using Mongo and knuckled and opened this. This video has everything <laughs> from beginning to end, so that's me starting with uh, ballooning of the external iliac artery, trying to get a wire through that, and passing the sheath after that, and the next step I'll show you, got the pedal axis from below, and trying to fight that area with reverse card, we had a balloon from above and to poke through. Short, small wires wouldn't work, really had to go with big ones, 035, um, to get through that. And we're ballooning from below now with a 4 balloon. You can see that tight lesion up there, and we're trying to go up and externalize the wire. This is CSI from below the PT, and CSI the entire thing above, and ballooning a whole bunch. Trying to get some flow there, you can see it's all pretty bad calcified, and the flow is not as great. And there's some flow that comes through the SFA after we balloon extensively. This used like almost five, six different balloons to open up that plane and slowly start coming back. And I lost the second vessel after we performed a therectomy. So we went, went ahead and opened that. But this is the final flow that we got on the SFA. And um, we went from above and opened that perineal as well to get a two vessel runoff. And that's two vessel came back. And the AT is still CTO in that segment, but uh, we're getting two vessel runoff to, the, to that foot. Sorry, that's the end of the picture. Um, going back here, that's just to show how we externalized. We had the PT axis, and then we had the wire come from the left groin destination sheath. And so, we thought everything is done after this, and we're trying to close the case. And, and then found out after we pulled the CSI wire back, it got stuck to that calcified segment. And this is another step. We're trying to snare that CSI wire. So confident we got it, pulled it back, and I called at the end of the day, and we're done. Trying to pull this back but I was so fast that I left it in the sheath and this wire got stuck in the sheath. Um, and then we literally had no other option except it's, it's, there's no, nothing to pull this back. The snare is out with the wire um, stuck in that sheath. So I was like, just pull the sheath back and try to get it out. Um, and then when we tried to pull the sheath back, it got locked in the subcutaneous layer in the skin and the sheath came out with no wire. Um, so that's the wire that's locked in the subcutaneous tissue. Turns out to be a thin guy, so I just did a small incision in the neck and pulled out the hemostat. A little mini surgery there. And it was actually a very big piece of wire that came back. It was this, not the radio pack wire. It was like this long wire that was stuck to the subcutaneous plane. So we were able to take that out and suture that area, and he healed well. And um, he's doing great, recovered well. With, uh, had great toe amputation of the necrotic toe. and. Follow-up two week, um, no further amputations done, and follow-up in six months, patent SFA pop and two vessel run off to the foot, and he's uh, healing his two amputation. That's the end of our case, and um, thank you for the opportunity again, and I'm open to questions here. Thank you. It's a, it's a very challenging case, um, well presented. So so the, the heavy, dense calcification, particularly in the SFA, where it was just eccentric and everywhere, I might have missed, what was the, what was the final therapy you did there? So how, what was the final treatment to that SFA? So the SFA was just a drug coated balloon at the end. Okay. I did not, I did not stent it across. I, mean, it's, uh, I shaved, atherectomized everything, um, and then we put a DCB. I actually did uh, multiple balloon inflations, chocolate balloon, and then did a, a drug coated balloon at the end. I know with all this calcification stuff, the outcome long term, I'm not sure, but um, there was no big dissection, and the flow improved 
And after I opened the second vessel, the flow was actually pretty brisk in the SFA, so I decided to leave it alone. And that, that area where you did balloon-assisted tracking up and over, did you ever do anything else there? Was that just left as a balloon? And, and the iliac, I yeah. just ballooned everything in that iliac, external iliac, all the way into this. I just put a DCB in that area. I didn't have okay. to stand. Um, everything was like a stent to begin with, so I just wanted to get some flow through that and heal this wound. Um, but surprisingly, after six month follow-up, his ultrasound showed that it still has two vessel runoff, um, monophasic in PR and um, biphasic in um, the PT vessel. So it's doing good. So, uh, for, so for the panel, so so immense calcification like this. How does this kind of change? Would you guys have approached this case differently as a result of that? Do you use different final therapies? What do you guys think? Uh, these cases are um, always a challenge, and I think you need to think through the the it, step one. If that doesn't work, step two, step three. What's your algorithm going to be? Before, you know, after you review the angiogram. Um, uh, you know, some of these cases just getting up and over with the sheath can right. can be takes a, a right. surprising amount of time. So, in these cases, uh, uh, I often, if there's room, will go anti-grade to just kind of minimize that um, sort of thing. Uh, but um, calcification when you're dealing with long lesions is uh, always a challenge, and um, I think just kind of getting across some of these, uh, referring back to that last case at rendezvous, sometimes you just can't. Uh, uh, do some of the conventional things you usually would to cross a CTO. So um, I think calcification is, uh, uh, requires you to kind of think through um, a few different options. Uh, but I generally would probably um, start with pedal axis uh, if I was planning to atherectomize. The other reason, I, I usually, I think we've, a lot of uh, other um, operators at this meeting uh, don't tend to sheath the the tibials, and that's certainly my practice too. I just use a 2.6 French 018 microcatheter to support my retrograde wire. But in these cases where I'm, uh, you know, dealing with a lot of heavy calcification, I'm not sure if there's thrombus in that adductor canal as part of that lesion. I do like a 5 French slender sheath in the um, PT because when I atherectomize, I just leave it cracked open and let it bleed a little bit. And if I get no flow out of the sheath, I know my something's obstructed. And it also, uh, you know, all that debris follows the path of least resistance, so it kind of works as a filter. Right. And um, if you do have then no bleeding out of your pedal sheath, you know you got to um, figure right. that out and troubleshoot that. So, so that's probably how I would have approached this case. Uh, Charles, what do you think? What's that? Oh, he, he, just, he just got back, <laughs> so oh, to, to, to oh, wow. his credit. I do use this. I I, when I get pedal axis, I usually do put in a sheath personally, and I use the four or five slender because I find that it delivers way easier than the, than the cook, the short cook needle, where I feel like a half the time I'm having to make a massive uh, skin nick, which in transecting the artery usually because of how superficial they are. Um, and I find that it delivers easier. I can deliver more equipment if I need. It's technically the same outer diameter, and I just feel like it's slightly less traumatic. Personally, it's been my personal experience. Sheet also for the pedal access, mostly because if you ever have to exchange the wire or the catheter, I feel like it's better through the sheath than having to exchange it through the the okay. vessel itself. And sometimes, especially in these calcified, like it's you know calcified all the way down to the foot, like right. that's where you end up with an access site problem, right? right. Where you stick it and they mm -hmm. end up with a little dissection from right. the calcium that got stuck. So I usually put a sheet there. But the other thing I have to commend you on is finding the retained foreign body. That was, because I have definitely had cases where like, they did not realize that a piece of the wire came off. With all this calcium, I, I couldn't yeah. actually see the radio opaque part. And then I found the wire, and I was like, I don't think that's the right part. And I just yeah. felt the CSI wire. It's like a very stiff part. So yeah. I'm, something is broken. Then I kept looking, and I was like, oh, that's the wire. And then I pulled it back. and. And snared it, I could have just spent a little more time snaring, and we were like, gosh, we're done finally. We'll just take it out. And then I pulled it really fast, and I lost it in the sheath. It was my mistake. I could have just taken it out yeah, but completely. It happens. And then in the sheath, there's no other way to pull. I was trying, okay, maybe put another balloon right next to the sheath, but it may push it in there, but at least we have it in the sheath. So I pulled the sheath back, came to the subcutaneous layer, and we know it was subcutaneous because away from the vessel when I did a groin shot and uh, just a little, little incision. Turns out to be he's this very thin guy, so it was not a major surgery for him, but. Yeah, um, so if, if ever you think you have a retained body, it's good to just get a CAT scan. <laughs> That's, oh, yeah. Because otherwise, it's actually really hard. Even if you floro all up and down and everything, sometimes you just can't see it. Yeah, right. So I, I think the axial imaging really helps. <laughs> yes, sir. Mr. Pondo, you know, uh, nice case for you. Atherectomy is a submittable space. I, you know, I don't know how well it works. I don't know what you guys yeah. do. I typically don't do it. And once or twice, you have, like, when it's especially formed with the lymph yeah. vein, often it's often calcified also. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, right. And for the same reason, again, balloons alone, if you ever go back and I just very quickly do a recoil. So I typically will start.
then the subject to both portions. Yeah, yeah. That's the carbon, uh, the vessel itself. Yeah, I, I was going to make the same comment. First, thank you for presenting that retained foreign body, too, uh, because uh, I think a couple things. Every time I create a complication, I go back and think about the house of God and check your pulse before you check the patient's pulse, you know? Like, don't do something more stupid and make the thing even worse. So, you know, like, be thoughtful, you know, don't panic. Just kind of think through, okay, I'm going to, the, these are the three steps I've got to take to get this thing out. And so don't be hasty when you create a complication or issue. And um, uh, the other thing, too, is, yeah, atherectomy, um, I, I think with uh, really heavily calcified lesions, um, the uh, intravascular lithotripsy is probably the strategy. I, I forgot would, to mention I that. That was yeah. done also. Uh -huh. That was a pretty, pretty <laughs> pricey procedure, actually. It turns out to be I used shockwave uh, six O balloons um, twice, and then it, uh, the first time it just like burst open the shockwave balloon, and then I used a second shockwave balloon plus the atherectomy. It was pretty intense calcification. Nothing would go through. But it turns out a very short subanimal segment. Luckily, it didn't have a long segment. It was just that second balloon that I showed you that expanded. That was just the only area. But I said it's to expand, at least get some flow in there. But, but I agree with your point. It's, it's important to not just slice through a subanimal plane. <laughs> I'll occasionally do it in the subanimal space, but only with directional atherectomy. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, Knowing that I'm likely going to be laying down a scaffold, but it's just all about expanding it. But I agree with lithotripsy now. That's right. if you're subintimal and there's heavily calcified disease. The other thing, I didn't see your images, but I just present on heavily calcified <laughs> SFA disease. That's why I ran out too. My experience with directional atherectomy, it's great. You want to debulk. We all want to debulk and everything, right? And it's directional. You can direct it where you want to be, but that's really not the truth, okay? Because when these heavily calcified diseases, as you advance that catheter, it always wants to bias one direction. <laughs> And if it biases the same place two or three times, and you're never going to make as many passes as if you're subintimal because you only want to cut towards the vessel. But if it biases two or three times, you're going to have a perforation because it just goes and hits the exact same spot, and it pushes further into that subintimal um, towards the adventitia. And then at that point in time, you've created more complications mm -hmm. for yourself, and whereas you could have not. So oh, Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Right, Certainly so a complicated much case. Um, uh, we'll invite uh, Dr. Leslie uh, Yalvez up to talk on mechanical thrombectomy of a pacemaker-related subclavian vein thrombus using the penumbra system. Hello, CVI. I'm Leslie, a cardiology fellow. I'm here with my mentor, Dr. Salman Arain, to share with you a mechanical technique for a subclavian thrombus that's related to a um, pacemaker device. So our focus really with this strategy is to, for those secondary thrombus, which can be a challenge for us with the increasing use of pacemaker devices. So our patient um, received a dual chamber pacemaker 15 months before his symptoms. He uh, venogram during the implant showed patency from the axillary vein to the IVC. He then developed two days of new swelling of the forearm and, and arm, and he was diagnosed with a left subclavian vein thrombus. A pixaban was started, and interrogation of his pacemaker showed that it was functioning normally. Per, however, despite being on a pixaban for seven days, his symptoms got worse. His um, limited range of motion in the deltoids, biceps, and triceps to the point that he had to stop golfing. So we thought at this time that we decided that the press best course was a mechanical thrombectomy with the severity of symptoms that's less than 14 days in duration, also with our aim to reduce um, his bleeding risk. So here's the loss of compressibility of the subclavian vein. Implantation was via left subclavian approach. So we then shot our, um, we then shot the left subclavian vein from the left brachial vein, um, and we were faced with an 85 to 90 percent stenosis on that subclavian. We see the wires running along that vein. And this is really to show that visual of the mechanical power of the penumbra device. We got an O35 stork wire. We got an O35 stork wire um, advancing, successfully crossing that subclavian vein down into the right femoral. We then worked on the right femoral access for our ensnare system and also our penumbra device. And you see our penumbra here and then our ensnare going via that access. This ensnaring of the stork will really provide this railing for the penumbra to go all the way up into, subclav sub into the subclavian vein, um, our target site. We did multiple aspiration along that vein. You can see our little aspiration movements are, as we're working on it. Looking at how much progress we did with the, after our aspiration technique, 
we, um, it, there's improved flow on that left subclavian, but there's still stenosis, and we were still not quite happy with it. In this side-to-side -side comparison, you can see how much work we've done, and but how much progress, um, how much work we have left to do. So the um, stent angioplasty in this costoclavicular junction is not advised because they tend to have high rates of stent fraction and also stent reocclusion. So we decided that our second attack is going to have to be a balloon angioplasty. So we actually inflated or ever crossed multiple times along that subclavian until we got um, a recanalization that we were happy about. And again, this is our final um, before and after our two-prong attack, and we were quite happy with our less than 10% residual stenosis. So our patient, symptoms resolved in five days. He was back in the golf course in seven days, and now at three months, he's actually um, on a pixie band without any symptoms. And so um, upper extremity DVTs are actually very common um, after an ICD, after a pacemaker, but only 3% of them develop symptoms. And why do they happen? There's a lot of mechanism. The first one is hypercoagulability. There's been a lot of animal studies that shows that what they found is that these inorganic fillers and also silicates that um, covers the surface of the wire, triggers this intrinsic pathway that causes coagulability. The second thing is that concept of stasis of blood flow, that once we have two or more stents, the lumen size decreases, and then there's also um, the formation of, sorry, <laughs> of, um, um, of the uh, different the, uh, veins, and that causes that flow, reroutes the blood flow, causing decrease in, in in the size again. And again, that chronic inflammation that comes with first the initial cannulation to put in the device, but also just having those multiple leads causes this microlaceration in the endothelium that causes um, a chronic inflammation. And so from the ACCP, American College of Chest Physicians, we have our most recent revision in December 2021. The cornerstone of treatment is really anticoagulation. There are cases the ACCP wants us to think about, such as severe symptoms or the extent of the thrombus, where earlier cannulization might be more might be beneficial, such as with a mechanical thrombectomy. Again, this is a might, may be beneficial. Um, this has never been studied in a um, significant way via randomized controlled trial. So our key points that I learned a lot from this case is that two-prong stra strategy, that approach that, uh, that we can use in patients who cannot be treated with a stent or angioplasty, especially if that um, thrombosis is in the subclavian, which is usually associated with our pacemaker and ICD devices. Um, and so thank you so much for letting me share my case, and I hope you learned something from our strategy to help your future patients. Wonderful, thank you so much. So um, that pacemaker's never going away, that scar's never going away. So is he on a Pixaban for life at this point? Or what, he what's is, the he's thought? still on a Pixaban for life. Yeah, it's, it's incredibly common. I, I've seen folks try to use DCBs. It doesn't make any sense, but people do it. I've seen folks laser it and laser it with contrast, try to blow it up. I've seen all the above. Any other um, techniques you guys use in, in DVT, particularly around a device? Yeah. No, I think it's actually a really hard problem because we see it a lot in dialysis access, you know, because they all have pacemakers, or they don't all, but they often have pacemakers or they've had other catheters, and then they have this central vein stenosis. So I'm just wondering, how do you follow these? Because there isn't, I don't, I don't think there's a definite way to do it, but like I, our, our IR guys will go and do venograms every three months after they do, like they just schedule them for another venogram. Um, and we're in the VA system, so it's not like they're trying to get RVUs or anything, but I think they like are pretty aggressive test. with just, um, you know, following, because how else are you going to follow it, right? Yeah. So they do a venogram, and then they just angioplasty them to most, and, but this is for maintenance, maintenance of dialysis access, so yeah. it's like a yeah. different yeah. story, but how would you follow this? Clinically. <laughs> yeah. 
challenges there, and some of the bigger challenges in terms of who doesn't have Linux access or, or doesn't need it for, uh, uh, for the house is that, you know, he's relatively young and he may need to be replaced. That becomes a really big challenge in all terms of possible. And, and so it's so harder when it's occluded, because then you're doing like laser lead, laser lead extraction. I had one guy where I had to do laser lead extraction because both subclavians were occluded yeah. from bilateral pacemakers. Yeah. <laughs> I think one thing we've done in the instances where this happens is, and there was a talk on this yesterday morning, is ensuring there's not a secondary modality to it with a first rib entrapment or something. So getting a, a CT just to make sure there's not another, you know, doing your anti, doing um, a hypercoagulable workup just in case, and then also getting a chest CT to ensure there's no other an anatomical reason for it to be happening too. Oh, it's, a, it's a great case. It's something we're dealing more and more with. And, and thank you for presenting Thanks your so team's expertise. Um, we'll bring up uh, Dr. Christensen next uh, to talk about urgent mechanical thrombectomy in a patient with acute PE. Is Dr. Christensen? Maybe Dr. Christensen's not here. Okay. Is Dr. L. Halabi here? Is Dr. Christensen here? <laughs> Well, man, we could have talked so much more about, about thrombectomy in some of these cases. Um, do we know if we have these other two? No? Okay. Well, in that setting, unless any other comments from the panel about the cases we've seen, um, thank you guys all so much for being here. We'll be going through and reviewing these. You'll hear from uh, CVI about the thoughts of who will be promoted and progressing to the next round on Saturday. So thank you guys all so much.